श्रीमद भगवत गीता चैप्टर टू वर्स थर्टीन विथ दिस वर्स इन फ्रंट ऑफ मी टू नाइट I am both excited and apprehensive. Excited because this is one of the most important verses of the Bhagavad Gita. Apprehensive because this is also one of the most misunderstood verses. so we are into choppy waters tonight but if we can navigate well we'll get the calmness of the deep seas dehino asmin यथा देहे कौमारम यौवनम जरा तथा देहांतर प्राप्तिर धीरस तत्र न मुहयति सो देर इज the dehi the one with the body or the embodied one and shri krishna to dispel arjuna's grief and delusion is saying that just as spot the dehi there are childhood youth and old age in a similar way following the same principle there is death and then childhood again so there is the embodied one and for him childhood youth old age the cycle continues old age passes into death and death passes into childhood and then youth and then old age and then death and childhood so it continues and then he says do not be mohit or deluded arjun do not be deluded because this is just a cycle this is just a principle there is nobody actually taking birth or dying do not be deluded arjun it appears somebody has arisen but there is no somebody there is just a principle and wise people do not grieve or rejoice at principles and at the outset it would have become clear to you how the verse has become central to one of the most 
misleading rather disastrous misinterpretations we have thought of the dehi as a thing not even as a thing as a being if you read it correctly shri krishna is talking of the dehi as a principle principles are not things let alone beings a principle is not a thing you cannot hold a principle in your hand the apple falls towards the earth by the principle of gravity the apple can be held in your hand a bit of the earth too you can hold in your hand but can you hold gravity in your hand gravity is the principle so there is a principle at work here arjun there is a principle and you are grieving as if people are dying a principle is not a person a principle is not a thing or a being you are grieving as if persons are being killed as if persons would be decimated as if persons would be no more as if there would be a loss when something operates by a principle there is just the operation there is neither a gain nor a loss there is just the operation and the operation is being governed not by your will arjun but by the underlying principle itself so you are nobody you are nobody why are you attributing so much doership to yourself why are you feeling responsible for their death what is krishna teaching arjun krishna is teaching that the name of the principle is prakriti and things happen in prakriti as per designs patterns rules laws but the poor ego which really does not exist at all takes itself as the doer of things that are happening by virtue of laws are you getting it so the water droplet falls towards the earth or the apple and then there is the deluded ego that thinks that it has caused the droplet to fall in thinking that it has caused the droplet to fall it gives birth to itself so the ego takes birth by thinking that it is doing something please understand in general an entity does something after taking birth correct first comes the birth then comes the action first comes the actor then comes the action and this appears to us as quite common sensical right first there has to be the doer and then will come the deed that is true when the doer is real but when the doer is unreal you know how the fallacious logic proceeds the deed comes first and then by inference by misinterpretation the doer is supposed to exist well you know the deed is happening since the deed is happening there ought to be a doer since the deed is happening and i do not know why the deed is happening the apple is falling towards the earth and i do not understand gravity 
the apple is seen to be falling to the earth and I do not understand gravity. So what do I infer? If a deed is happening, there has to be a doer. And I do not know gravity. But I am seeing the deed or the action and the action is that the apple is falling to the so I presume, I suppose, I infer that there is somebody, some invisible hidden character, some fictitious, benevolent or malicious being that is taking the apple from the branch and putting it to the earth. Because if it is happening, somebody must be doing it. And I do not know gravity. What is gravity? Prakriti. Prakriti is just principles, right? Everything in Prakriti is just governed by laws. Prakriti is principles. But I have never observed Prakriti to know that it is just a set of principles. I have never observed. So I do not know Prakriti. I have also not observed ever, myself ever. So I do not know myself. I do not know anything. But this much I have come to understand that if there is an action, behind it there is always an actor. This much of sense I think I have. So I look at the falling apple and I infer that there is an invisible being, a ghost or something. There is an invisible being that went to the apple, plucked it from the branch and put it to the ground. That's how the ego is born. The deed comes first and then the doer assumes itself to exist. By first of all, attributing, ascribing, the deed to itself. You see, something is happening. If something is happening, there must be somebody doing it, right? There is the speech, so there has to be a... Ah, and that's what the saints have tried so hard to tell you. As most people are, there is just the speech, there is no speaker. There is just the sound. There is nobody speaking really. Tell me, who spoke? Who spoke? Show me the name of the speaking being. Is there somebody who is speaking? No. There is just cause and effect. My hand went to this surface with a particular speed and then it was suddenly resisted and something hit my hand. If something hit my hand, there must be somebody who is hitting my hand. Oh my God, there are ghosts here. My hand was going downwards with a particular speed and then it was suddenly resisted. Something resisted my hand and hit the palm here. So there has to be somebody. No, there is no somebody. There is just Newton's laws. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Full stop. But if I am scientifically or spiritually illiterate, I'll think that, you know, this hand, the movement of the hand, the swing of the palm was resisted by another conscious being. There is no conscious being here. There is just a principle at work. You get this. Similarly, whatever most people do, there is no conscious being there. There are just principles. Prakriti is principles. Like chemical equations. Laws, laws and laws. Laws of biology, laws of chemistry that are expressed by laws of mathematics, laws of psychology, laws, just laws. 
people do not exist people are just representation of laws but because we cannot see that it's just laws at work we assume that there is somebody existing to do something and that assumption has cost the world a great deal especially india we have assumed that there exists some jivatma inside people there is nobody there is just laws principles because people are chemicals and chemicals do not have a soul chemicals move chemicals react matter is always in a state of motion just as shri krishna says that arjun prakriti means gati in prakriti everything is constantly moving similarly in matter there is constant activity even if you want to you cannot bring matter to a standstill it's only at zero kelvin temperature that atomic and nuclear activity ceases all the energy is sucked out from matter and therefore there is no energy to move around but zero kelvin is impossible zero kelvin is a theoretical number it cannot be achieved so there is always movement just as bhagavad gita says science knows things cannot ever be brought to a standstill so there would always be movement but the uneducated i thinks that beyond the movement or behind the movement is a mover no there is no mover there is just there is just movement take the example of a billiards or snooker table let's say a large number of balls are lying on the table large number large number of balls of different colors and you set a couple of balls into motion right and what do you find immediately all the balls are moving and if you can have somehow a frictionless surface hmm and frictionless contact as well in which there is no dissipation of energy upon contact then the movement of the balls on the table will continue till the end of time for an infinite period the balls will just keep moving they'll move they'll hit each other they'll change direction they'll change velocity and they will keep moving till infinity that's prakriti that's prakriti does the ball have a being does the ball have a jivatma there's nobody there is just the principle just the principle but if you look at the ball and as we said you are scientifically and spiritually uneducated you might think that the ball has volition of its own when the movement of the ball starts you might be tempted to think that something has taken birth when the movement of the ball stops let's say one of the balls falls into the hole so its movement has ceased you might be tempted to think that the ball has died but there is no birth no death in prakriti there is no birth no death there are just chemicals reactions laws processes there is just nobody the ego is a piece of imagination its own imagination there is nobody who can certify or validate the existence of the ego the ego certifies its own existence 
the ego writes i exist and signs underneath till they go to take this to some gazetted officer and get it ratified there is nobody who can ever prove that the ego exists ego alone becomes its own attorney its own ratifier its own validator do you get this it's a very very important principle very important and you can never give it too much attention please be very careful what does this mean just because there is action do not assume there is an actor just because there is movement do not think there is some conscious or living entity behind the movement noers have continuously talked of dead men walking do you understand that can't a robo walk and machines talk and today ai can talk very sensibly do you know how you determine whether a machine has gained sentience hmm? there is a particular test i forget the name is it the turing's test and the test says that you keep the machine behind a wall and interact with the machine the machine is behind the wall so you do not know whether you are talking turing's turing's test right so the machine is behind a wall so you do not know whether you are talking to a machine or to a human being and if you cannot tell cannot differentiate whether you are talking to a machine or to a human being then the machine has attained sentience if by interacting with the machine you cannot come to know whether it was a machine or a human being then the machine has attained consciousness which means that you can be fooled into thinking that machines are conscious right there can be very sophisticated machines that can fool you into thinking that they are not machines one such sophisticated machine is a human being which is a machine but which fools you into thinking that it is a conscious or sentient entity it is just a machine there is nothing in it no but we have souls no shri krishna very clearly says you are just processes and processes do not have souls there is nothing inside you but you know we have commonly believed that there is something inside us and machines do not have that we have that that's ego you want to feel that you are not a machine so you come up with a construct that is exclusive to you and not found in machines see if i have to prove that i am different from a machine how do i prove that i'll say i have something that the machine does not have so what do i say i have in an exclusive sense a soul thing is you two are a machine and machines don't have souls but you don't want to admit that it hurts you but let it hurt you because it is hurting someone who does not exist so there is no hurt arjun you kill you are killing someone who does not exist so there is no death it's a very delicate thing to understand it is a principle of pure subjectivity just because something appears to you or is experienced by you it does not gain existence right experience cannot validate existence okay can it you can experience mm -hmm. flying goblins can't you do they become existent by your experience similarly the ego experiences itself 
But just because you experience something, it does not become existent. And if you pay attention to your everyday life, you see that. Experience. Two is just phenomena, a chemical thing. Which means there is no need of an experiencer. There is no need to postulate a sentient experiencer. Sodium and water react. There is, there is, a, there is a great deal that happens when the reaction does takes place. There is sound, there is heat, there is explosion. Does sodium experience it? Does water experience it? Nobody experiences it. Things are just happening. Why do you think somebody is doing it and somebody is experiencing it? Are you getting it? Arjun, in Prakriti, there is just movement. There is neither birth nor death. There is just change of form. Prakriti has a great tendency to keep taking different shapes and forms and remain in a state of continuous movement. There is no birth or death there. There is just change of form. Just as you say the child has become young. The youth has become old. Similarly you should say the old one has become dead. In that sense death is a stage of life. Death is not the end of life. It is just another stage of life. And then the dead one becomes the child. There is no discontinuity. In Prakriti there is no discontinuity. Discontinuities are only when there is a sentient being. For example, the balls are rolling on the billiard surface. How will a discontinuity appear? A man comes and stops a moving ball. That's again one of the Newton's laws. No? Things keep moving unless an external force acts on them. But in Prakriti there is no discontinuity because there is nobody outside Prakriti to come and interfere. There is nobody. There is just nobody. The ego does not exist. There is just constant movement. But we think that there was a discontinuity when a birth took place. And there is another discontinuity when death takes place. Sri Krishna is saying, don't be fooled. He makes it very clear. He says, yatha tatha. Just as and just as. Just as there is the child, the young man and the old man, similarly, yatha tatha, similarly there is the dead man and then again the child. There is no discontinuity. If there is no discontinuity, tell me who has died. <laughs> tell me who has died. Has the sun died at sunset? What are you weeping for? Has the sun taken birth at sunrise? What are you celebrating? It's a cycle. It's a continuous cycle with no discontinuity. You just have to understand this. Then there is no need to move into extreme emotions and be affected this way. Are you getting it? It's a process, that's all. 
there is nobody within the process. No, but there has to be a difference between unconscious matter and consciousness, Jad and Chetan. There has to be a difference, no? Sri Krishna makes it clear. Elsewhere in the Gita, a little down the road, there is no difference between Jad and Chetan. Ego for its own sake, to ensure its own sustenance, comes up with that kind of a divide. It says, you know, I am the looker, so I am sentient. And this is the one being looked at, so this is insentient. She can say that. Ah. <laughs> Horse dung. The seer and the seen are two ends of the same dualistic process. And they belong to the same dimension. They belong to the same dimension. The two are not qualitatively different from each other. Jad and Chetan are just one. And he gives them a common name. And the common name is Prakriti. But for your convenience he says, but because you know you are fond of creating separations. So I will call the so-called conscious one as Paraprakriti and the so-called unconscious matter as Aparaprakriti. So the distinction between mind and matter that the West grappled with for centuries was resolved by Sri Krishna with a Sahaj sway of his hand. He says there is no difference. The West have kept wondering, did matter come first or mind comes first? What is the relationship between mind and matter? And Krishna had put an end to this debate long back. He had said there is no difference between mind and matter. One of them, them came first. It's not a chicken and egg story. They both are one. Then why do they appear different? Because you want to survive. The ego wants to survive. Therefore it wants to think that the seer and the seen are on different planes. The seer and the seen are one. This is matter. You too are matter. And if you are conscious, this too is conscious. The equation has to be clear. You are too keen on saying you are conscious, okay, then you are conscious and this is also conscious. You are only as conscious as this one is. And if you insist that this one is just dead matter, then you too are just dead matter. The point is that there is no dimensional difference between the two of you. Both of you are just Prakriti. Both of you are just the same stuff. So There is the seer and, they are the, and there is the scene. By equating them, the ego has been obliterated, thrown out of the equation. Please understand, if these two are different, then there has to be the I and the world. Correct? If these two are different, then I am the I and this is the world. By equating these two, Sri Krishna has sentenced the ego to death. You two are one, now where is the I? Either both are I or none of them are I. And this is absurd. Both of us are I. I exists only in an environment of self-attributed exclusivity. Only I am the I. You cannot be I. If both of us are I, then nobody is I. I am exclusively I. You can say, fine, if you are I, then this too is I. And I cannot tolerate that. Extremely possessive about its own existence. I have to exist as somebody extraordinary. I am a singularity. I cannot share my existence. Hmm. 
Do you understand? There is just a movement, there is just a process. Gautam the Buddha said there is just a stream. Continuous stream. The continuity of the stream is visible. The stream as a composite entity can be given a name, but within the stream there is nobody having an individual existence. If there is somebody having an individual existence, at most you can say the stream has an individuality. Who has an individuality? At most the stream. What is the name of the stream? Prakriti. So at most there is Prakriti that can be given a name. Everything inside Prakriti is just process. It cannot have a name. You don't exist as a separate individual. How can you have a name? How can you have a name? How to give a name to one particular water droplet in the ocean? What's the problem? If I give, if I try to confer an individualistic existence upon a particular droplet in the ocean, what practical problem will I face? There is that droplet. I say that droplet has a particular name. What's the name? Mary. So I'm besotted. You know, that's my droplet, Mary. The moment you name her, she has gone. Because she is not distinct from the other droplets and they are constantly. So there is no Mary. There is no Mary. But you want to believe there is Mary because you are John. You want to believe that you exist and you are John. Therefore you want to believe that that particular droplet exists and she is Mary. But the thing is that you know, the moment, even before you can fully pronounce Mary, Mary is gone. Mary is constantly mingling and merging and becoming one with the entire ocean. He does not have a separate existence. That's what kills the I. I don't have a separate existence, but I exist only in separation. There have to be divisions and boundaries, but there are no divisions and boundaries. And now you understand why the ego keeps on creating artificial boundaries always. Everything has to be divided. This country versus that country, my property versus your property, my shirt versus your shirt, my body versus your body, my interest versus your interest. Those walls have to be raised so that the fictitious thing called the ego can be justified. Otherwise there is just the flow. Just the flow. And this ego, because it does not exist, it is extremely insecure about its existence. Its existence is not even constantly threatened. Its existence is completely fictitious. Therefore, the ego is insecure about itself all its life. Are, are you getting it? You are pretending. Let's say you are pretending that you have a that you have a What should I call it? Sweet ball in your mouth. Pretending. Hmm? Something like a gulab jamun. So in a group of people you are moving about like this. Because you are extraordinary, you know, the ego must be extraordinary. If it is ordinary, it cannot exist. I am distinct from the rest of you. How? 
I have this. But you fully well know there is nothing here. There is this party going on and for two hours continuously you have to prove that you have something extraordinary. How will you live for those two hours? You will be extremely insecure and worried continuously because you have something that you do not have. So it has to be continuously defended. Somebody comes to speak to you. You want to say, Hello! And finished. So precarious is the existence of the ego. A simple hello can kill it. So now somebody comes to you and what do you do? You remain tight-lipped. That's ego. Because if I say hello, the secret is out. Goose is done. So you come to me and greet me with affection and very kindly you say, hello. What do I say? Hmm. Because something that does not exist has to be proven to exist. That's the reason the knowers, the well-wishers have advised you to see that the ego is not your friend. Hmm? It is just a burden. Get rid of this thing and see how smoothly, how freely you can live. That's called Sahajata. Then you don't have to keep thinking, then you don't have to keep wondering, you don't have to be worried all the time, you don't have to secure something that is, that is fundamentally indefensible. How long can you continue this way? How long? At some point, it will be revealed. Balloon will be punctured from within. So, Parth, don't allow yourself to be deluded. Don't allow yourself to be deluded. But instead of seeing that this is the best kind of elucidation of the non-existence of the self, most of the commentators over the centuries have interpreted this verse to mean the existence of the self. They have said, you know what Krishna is saying? Krishna is saying that there does exist an ego. Jivatma. And when the body dies, the Jivatma goes into another body and then again the body grows up and then again that body dies, so the Jivatma goes into some other body and then that body grows up. And then that body dies and then the Jivatma goes to the next body. They have interpreted this verse to mean that which is completely nonsensical. And that is also completely unjust to the spirit of Gita. And the teachings of Vedanta. That's not what Vedanta teaches. The fundamental thing in Vedanta is that only the truth is existent. All else is fiction. What is this little self or Jivatma then? Nothing. Fiction. But this has served the priests well. So after the death, they can claim, you know, the disembodied being is hanging around and is quite annoyed. So you have to pay me 10,000 bucks. So that I may, you know, appease him. And only I know how to appease him. 
because only I know the secret mantras. So you pay me 10,000 rupees. That fellow has died. The body is gone. But the disembodied being is there on that tree. And he's growling. And demanding some money. Has to visit the pub tonight. Entry charges. No, but you know, even if you give him the money, how will he enter? No, no, no. That will assure him of a companion. There is another one, female one. She too is quite unhappy. I'll pay her some money and bring her here and then these two together can enter the pub or disc and have a great time on the dance floor. There would only be the dance and no dancer. That kind of stupidity. And we have continued to believe in that nonsense. We have continued to believe because we want to believe that we are. Let's not blame the commentators or the priests beyond a point. We want to believe in that nonsense because we want to believe that we are. We want to defy the truth. We want to believe that the truth can be and we too can be and the two of us can concurrently side by side coexist. No, only the truth exists. You do not exist. You are fiction. If the two of you can exist parallelly, then the truth has limits, no? If you can keep something alongside something else, then both those things are limited because both those things will need to have a boundary. Otherwise, you cannot keep them side by side. Truth is unlimited. Therefore, only the truth is you are not. That hurts us. Oh, that hurts the non-existent one. That's what Arjun is being taught. Yes, somebody is being hurt, but the one being hurt does not exist. So nobody is being hurt. That's something you must keep telling yourself. Yes, I am hurt, but the one who is being hurt does not exist. So there is nobody hurt. So let me just then fool around. Hmm? So long back, I put it this way. I said, only the ego gets hurt. When you feel hurt, just remind yourself, only the ego gets hurt. So there is no need to side with the ego and act as if something very important has happened. There is nobody who can get hurt except the ego. And the ego anyway is fiction. So there is nobody who is hurt. Chill. But then there is nobody to chill also. What to do then? No, sir. To be hurt, there has to be somebody. To chill out, there has to be nobody. Huh? Interesting. What's that? What does that mean? Yes. Chilling out is the way of Prakriti. Getting hurt is an aberration caused by the vicious gate crasher called the ego. Prakriti is always parting. So Prakriti is continuously chilled out. Prakriti is a continuous celebration. Continuous celebration is the Prakriti. In that continuous celebration, there stands this annoyed entity called ego, never satisfied, always hurt. Irrespective of how you deal with her, you may touch her with the softest gloves, you may mollycoddle her. She manages to somehow get bruised, always, with cotton wool, you just gently touched her and you find she is bleeding, deeply hurt and you wonder, I did nothing. 
How did this happen? That's her way. If she is not hurt, she does not exist. She has to be hurt to feel existent. Are you getting it? She continuously keeps devising proofs. She continuously keeps concocting stories. Just to assure herself and the world that she indeed does exist. The wise ones have tried to convince her, see, your existence is your suffering. Even if you manage to convince everybody that you do exist, what does that mean? That means that you will continuously suffer because your existence is your suffering. So why don't you just put yourself to rest? And the ego says, after that, the wise ones have said, party. When you are not there, there is just the party. Anand. There is no anand, no joy with the ego. Therefore, the ego resists celebrations. The ego resists deep, selfless happiness. Even if it wants happiness, it wants shallow, self-centered happiness. The ego avoids depths of all kinds. In depths, there is the truth. And where there is the truth, the ego cannot be. Only one continuous obsession the ego has, self-defense. The ego is always busy defending itself. Never jobless, never relaxed, never free, never available. She is always occupied. Occupied with defending herself. And the defenses are so weak, they crack up upon the slightest touch. So when a wise man comes and tells us something, it becomes a compulsion with us to misinterpret that. We almost knowingly misinterpret it. We want to believe there does exist somebody within us. There is nobody because there is just the body. There is just the body. Rest is all fiction. But the mind, the mind, the mind is the body. The mind is the body. Then what does it mean to uh, take the ego to its completion? What does it mean when you say that there are the three? Don't you always keep saying there are the three? Uh, I say out of these three, one is a fact, one is the truth and the third one is fiction. Prakriti is facts. Atma is truth. Ego is so when we say that the ego has to be taken to Atma, which is the truth, what we mean is that if you take it to Prakriti, it will distort the facts. Prakriti is facts, right? And facts are at your disposal. You can use facts to prove anything that you want to. So the ego is known to misutilize Prakriti, which is facts, for its own very dubious purposes. But what happens when the ego moves to truth? It dissolves. Facts can be used. Truth is unusable.
truth alone is the death of ego. But then again there is the little problem. The direct movement to truth is not possible. You move to the truth only via the facts. But we said facts can be distorted, misutilized, just as has happened in this verse over the centuries. So what does that leave us with? One has to go to the truth, but one can go to the truth only via the facts and one can distort the facts. So then what is needed? The right intent, honesty. That alone can save you. When you go to the facts, you need to have the intent to respect the facts, not to use or distort the facts. Are you getting it? I am sure you have not missed a very important conclusion in all this. If ego is fiction, birth and death too are just stories. Because in Prakriti there is just the continuous stream, right? With no beginning and no end, there is a stream. You keep going backwards, you do not trace its origin. And you keep traveling downstream, you never come to the end. Does the future ever have an end? Do you ever say this is the end point of the future? The future is backwards also you keep going. No birth, no death. And then there is Atma that is beyond the stream of time. In that too there is obviously neither birth nor death. Birth and death both are only to the ego. The moment you keep the ego aside, Birthless, deathless, that's who you are. The body will meet the dust. Think of a process. As the process died, who am I? A process. Has the process died? No. I'm still there. I'm still around. It's just that I... I, I I appeared crystallized in the form of a body and after death I am scattered. I am there in the air molecules, I am there in the clouds, I am there in the soil of the fields, I am there in the leaves of the trees, but I am still there. I have not gone anywhere. Arjun, there was never a time when you were not there or I was not there. Does that become clear to you now? Prakriti is immortal. Atma is timeless. In both there is no death. Gita takes you beyond the fear of death. If you have really, really attended to and respected and loved the Gita, you cannot die. Hmm? Sri Krishna is no ordinary guru. He is the utmost guru. Top class. His student cannot meet some ordinary fate and die like a commoner. Sache Guru Ka Balaka Marin. Now you understand that? Death is gone. 
put death to death. To the deluded one, death comes as an end. And the awakened one puts an end to death. Oh, what will the buffalo boy do now? Run away. Run away for his life, scared. Oh, he's our friend. We mean no disrespect. But then, if death is a fiction, so is the buffalo man. Nobody goes away. The soil came to you in a particular form. The form went back to the soil. The soil will rise again, somewhere, at some point. Take another form. There is no end to forms. Nobody has gone away. They are all around. If they are all around, then you too have been around since very long, no? Oldies. Nobody is newly born here. They have been around since long and will be around for very long. If Prakriti is who we are. It's a beautiful thing. When you know you are the Atma, you feel no compulsion to stay away from Prakriti. And when you are the ego, then to a part of Prakriti you are attracted. And to a part of Prakriti you have repugnance, hatred, repulsion. Have you seen that? The Atmasthvan, the liberated one, has no special consideration towards any special or exclusive part of Prakriti. By giving up on the limited self, you embrace the entirety of Prakriti. That's the party. Everything is yours now. And to this we said, Atmasth within and Prakratist without. No half measures anywhere. Just as the ego is afraid of death, it is also afraid of a lot of things in Prakriti. Have you seen how deeply the ego is afraid of pleasure? Have you seen? The ego has to be afraid of Prakriti because the ego exists calling itself as distinct from Prakriti, right? The ego does not want to admit that it is just the process. It says, no, I am distinct. So, I cannot embrace Prakriti because I am distinct from it. So, there has to be a lot of Prakriti that I must abhor, reject, condemn. So different people, different cultures, different moralities 
condemn this or that. In fact, you do not accept something without condemning its opposite. So the ego is afraid of suffering. It is also afraid of pleasure. Because deep pleasure becomes joy. And in joy there is no ego. The liberated one has no reason to fear or reject anything in Prakriti. It's a very strange thing. Because we have thought of religiousness as synonymous with rejection or renunciation. No. We have been with Ishashtavakra a lot of late. And he has been constantly saying that the liberated one is free of both desire and lack of desire, Icha and Anicha. He is free of both. And Isha Vasya says that the liberated one consumes but does not. Consumes as if he is renouncing. Because we are just processes, so we have become very afraid of all the things that remind us that we are just processes. We want to assert that we are not processes, that we are persons. Persons with volition, existence, consciousness. So when stuff comes that reminds us that we are just processes, we become very jittery. So all the stuff, for example, that animals exhibit, man becomes eager to demonstrate that he does not share it with them. For example, we wear clothes. Now clothes are so commonplace, so ubiquitous, we never, we never want to question, why do we wear clothes? You wear clothes so that you can prove to yourself that you are not animals. And you need to prove to yourself that you are not animals because you are animals. Otherwise there is no need to prove. Is there a need to prove the obvious? Is there a need to prove the self-evident? But we are animals, therefore we put on clothes, so that it can be proven that we are not animals. That's why we are so afraid of death. Because if you are not afraid of death, you cannot exist. If you say, there will be no death to me, that also means that you do not exist as an ego. Therefore you have to pretend that you are afraid of death so that you can pretend that you exist. This fellow is shivering. Hmm? He is deeply anxious that the rupees one million in his pocket might be stolen anytime. 
he has loudly publicized to all of us that he is a millionaire. And now he keeps worrying and shivering all the time that his money might be stolen. He has to worry because there is no money. He just fooled all of us. There is nothing that he has. But to solidly prove that he is indeed a millionaire, he also has to solidly act as if he is afraid the money might be stolen. If he does not pretend that he is afraid, what will that prove? That there is no money. So he says, you see, there is so much money that I am afraid. There is so much money that I am afraid that it might be lost. Ego operates on inverted logic. Because there is the deed, so there has to be a doer. Similarly, because there is somebody afraid of coming to an end, therefore somebody must be existing. Fear comes first. Existence comes later. Fear of losing existence comes first. Existence comes later. Because there is no existence. It's an implied existence. It's a second-hand existence. It is called reflected consciousness in Western philosophy. You cannot know yourself without taking support of stuff around you. You take your existence as a reflection from something else. If your money does not exist, you do not exist. So your existence comes to you as a reflection of your money. And that's a very dangerous and very pitiable state to be in. No? I do not have any originality or authenticity. My existence itself is dependent on something else, either on objects or on logic. What is the logic? Because I am afraid of death, therefore I am alive. Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. So I am afraid, therefore I am. So let me be even more afraid because the more afraid I am, the more I am. <laughs> and thought is so often just worried. In fact, when you are not worried, thought ceases. Have you seen that? When you are in joy, there are no worries. Thought often comes to a standstill. So that's the way of the ego. Because I am worried, therefore I am. So let me be even more worried. So the ego keeps remaining afraid of death. Similarly, the ego keeps remaining afraid of sex. Because, you know, It will prove that I am an animal. Therefore, let me just stop it. The liberated one says, the body is indeed an animal. What is the problem with that? That which is not an animal is the truth. Animal is another name for process. Prakriti. There is just the truth and Prakriti. There is no intermediary who can regulate the animal. So there is no need for regulation. The ego is the regulator, right? The regulator is fictitious. Now this is very, very difficult to square with our concepts of liberation. What I am saying will just not fit in. We want to think of the liberated one as a renunciate. The more you think of the liberated one as a renunciate, the more you get to avoid liberation. You know, I have responsibilities. I cannot renounce my responsibilities. And liberation means absolute renunciation. 
so liberation is not my cup of tea the liberated one is not a renunciate he is completely one with prakriti he does not renounce prakriti he lets prakriti be he lets prakriti be does he consume it no he does not even consume does he renounce no he does not even renounce he lets the wind blow he does not make the wind blow he also does not force the wind to cease blowing are you getting it there is the action without the actor no worries there is the drive without the driver so you can just enjoy the scenery there is movement so there is a the drive but you are not on the driver's seat you just enjoy the ride but i don't i don't have to you know manage the ride no you have to enjoy the ride but what will happen to the car the car has been since the beginning of time it knows how to drive itself am i to do nothing am i purposeless no as long as you are there to pose this question you cannot be purposeless then what is my purpose your purpose is to come to purposelessness your purpose is to come to a point where the question of purpose starts appearing funny to you that's your purpose your purpose is to see the absurdity of the topic of purpose there is the rain no body raining there is no jivatma up there there is just the rain are you getting what then is atma very very interestingly atma is then pure prakriti who is speaking here if there is the rain and nobody raining then isn't there right now just the speech and nobody speaking yes that's all that's all what then is liberation speak without the speaker and you are home there is just the speech happening like the rain outside the clouds are raining you don't attribute doership or personhood to the clouds right the clouds are raining similarly the speaker is speaking but the clouds are unconscious aren't they yes absolute consciousness is to a, is to come to a point of annihilation of dualistic consciousness in absolute consciousness there is no consciousness but there has to be a difference between the clouds and the speaker the clouds are luckier that's only difference they didn't have to 
go through a process of knowledge and self observation to become just the clouds they always have been the clouds the speaker has to go through and keep going through a process of observation to remain just the clouds otherwise he can become a speaker i am the speaker the speech is mine he could say that the clouds therefore are far luckier they never attribute doership to themselves or maybe who knows they do sometimes after all how much do the clouds know about us how much do we know about the clouds or maybe we do maybe they do who knows who needs to know why know of irrelevant things know yourself and be liberated of the need to keep knowing trivia are you getting it the liberated one has therefore often been called as the dead one because he has become the clouds and we do not call the clouds as living so the liberated one is always is many times called the dead one the gone one the finished one he is gone his game is over he is liberated he is the clouds now you cannot look at him and say oh he is a person there is no person there obviously the body is there but the body has no person and a time will come when the body will decompose the crystal will fall apart that you cannot call as death because there was nobody inside the body now do you understand the verses the entire body of literature that celebrates death maro he jogi maro die and become the clouds and rain rain without a worry rain sans a bother rain with disdain what do you do all day i rain with stain i don't worry who gets wet why do you rain all the time you're so stupid you don't deserve a response this is my response i just rain i just rain no give me a reason no i just rain there has to be a reason no i just rain but we always have a reason no i just rain all reasons all purposes belong to the ego the ego cannot live without a reason or a purpose or a desire i don't have a reason or purpose or desire i just have justness what did you just do i just did justness sahajta reasonless abundance reasonless celebration reasonless vigor reasonless activity reasonless silence continuous 
purposeless dance incomprehensible to purposeful minds either incomprehensible or misinterpreted as being purposeful because you yourself are never free of purposes therefore when you find true purposelessness somewhere what do you do you superimpose a purpose on it you foist a purpose on it you claim you rather allege that there is a hidden purpose there a secret agenda of some kind there is no purpose there is just the rain what purpose does the cloud have it's just a little mysterious it wants to rain that's the only purpose especially when it finds you without an umbrella then it has to rain that's the only purpose a little bit of merry making some fun some laughter can i play spoil sport with you can i make fun of your new expensive t-shirt can i do my little thing with your makeup may i rain on all your plants that's all that's all that the cloud wants just to have fun that's what when there is no purpose then there is just fun good fun are you getting it who's getting it? such a nonsensical question i ask always hoping somebody would call out my nonsense instead you nod your heads you better keep nodding your heads as long as the heads are not rolling they must keep nodding mm -hmm. your heads are still too firmly on your shoulders they must roll on the floors here and then you will be relieved of the obligation to nod you get it that's dharma dharma is only for the ego therefore the liberated one needs no dharma the liberated one transcends all dharma no dharma no laws no morality nothing applies to the liberated one all dharma is for the ego and the ego must stick to its dharma what is the ego's dharma when the truth reigns keep nodding yes the ego's dharma is to keep saying yes yes with a nod just keep saying yes with a nod that's dharma but only to the truth not to yourself is it making sense adharmic all of you <laughs> you know it's very relieving to look at people as processes it's even more relieving to look at yourself as a process you cannot help smiling when that happens somebody has irritated you annoyed you hit you hurt you and you realize the fellow was just like a falling stone a stone hits you do you hit the stone back because the stone is just a process hmm? there is a landslide 
and up from somewhere a stone falls on your shoulder or on your head what do you do you start cursing the stone it's a process the landslide is a process something fell on your shoulder you you can't hit it back just as you are a process you look at your desires you look at your anxieties your insecurities your this that and you realize all of that is just a process and that's so relieving so unburdening you're free you're liberated that alone is liberation to be unburdened of the need to call the process a person how to enjoy the rains let the drop meet the drop if the person meets the water the person will feel the need to preserve himself to secure himself let water meet water when the clouds rain you meet the clouds with your own rain now the two of you are one because essentially the two of you are anyway one that is prakriti you two are prakriti just that probably the cloud does not have the fictitious thing called the ego you two become the cloud keep the ego aside and rain with abandon that's how you enjoy the rains by raining in the rain what do you do in the rain i rain if you do anything else except raining in the rain then you are distinct from the rain and then you cannot enjoy then you will just defend yourself as a distinct entity in the rain become the rain i'm gone there is just the rain when the droplet falls on me it will not feel uninvited it will also not feel coveted it will feel at home water meeting water greetings benevolent master uh, my first question is more of an observation uh i am reading gita book from a kindle ebook now kindle provides popular highlights so kindle keeps track of uh, those texts which people are highlighting in their ebooks now this particular verse verse number 13 is one of the most popular highlight of kindle this is the verse which has been most misquoted and misunderstood maybe that is the reason that this particular verse is highlighted the most yeah but yeah like one highlights the target like one has the victim in one's crosshairs you highlight that which you want to consume or pray or feast upon in that sense we have highlighted this one you highlight a potential threat don't you yes so we have highlighted this one because this verse if rightly understood is a huge threat to our existence so we have taken great care to not to let this one pass safely we have ensured that we will corrupt its meaning so that we remain safe so it's a typical example of the ego laying its hands on yep. holy scriptures yes mm -hmm. example of the ego identifying a threat and neutralizing it
and you can extend this observation to all the things in the world in the sense of our relationship with them if we are highlighting something in this world chances are we are going to destroy and distort it we do not highlight things because they are virtuous or truthful the ego does not want virtue the ego has nothing for the truth for the ego its own security and preservation come first so if it just gets a whiff of truth somewhere it becomes very alert alert not in the sense of getting eager to surrender alert not in the sense of getting eager to welcome the beloved alert in the sense of getting ready and aggressive to counter an enemy if you find people rushing to temples now you can see what that means we highlight temples don't we we highlight temples so that we can distort their purpose <laughs> if there is something that the ego gives attention to the thing is in danger it's now running the risk of being misused misappropriated and robbed of its authentic nature and purpose if the ego says i love you or i respect you it's a red flag Hmm? when someone says uh, i love chicken yes in the same way travelers like goa when say i like a particular mountain when travelers in, say in the same way uh, my next question uh, is related to uh, you talked about the life being in a constant movement flux you talked about buddha so i have one observation i was reflecting on this verse today uh, i find that there is a conflict between linguistics language and life now life is continuous life is dynamic but language is static when we say this is a tree this is a tree so it means static this is is this means static this is a boy is whereas what it is pointing to is continuous so when we so clearly there is uh, a difference between the tool using which we ex, we explain life that is language when one, one almost feels like seeing that it's an intentional difference because if the tree is static then so is the seer of the tree so you want to assert that the ego is an entity just as the tree is an entity it's a thing equally i am a thing but if you see that the tree is a process tree is a stream then you will have to admit that the ego too is a stream and if the ego is a stream then the ego is nothing therefore language has to be deliberately constructed in a way that supports the ego if the tree is a flux then so is the seer of the tree no because you said today that seer and the sea are of the same dimension 
now if the scene is in the flux dimension that means shear also is in the flux dimension yes yes and that that can even be seen very logically you say i am the body now your body and the tree's body are very similar so if the tree is a flux so are you because you say you are the body so we uh, intentionally or maybe not intentionally also we uh, say this is the body but uh, i think we have to give uh, the benefit of doubt to ego because the least count of the senses using which we perceive it cannot detect very subtle changes now since it cannot detect subtle changes it is unable to see that it is a flow you cannot detect subtle changes in the gross material of the body but can't you detect the almost instantaneous changes in your mind and mood in a fraction of a second your universe changes right how did that happen if you were a static thing how did the thing so completely change in almost zero time yes but uh, okay okay i have to think uh, reflect on this even more uh, because it is very unnatural to uh, unnatural un non biological to uh, know that something is flux it is very uh, conducive biologically conducive you could you could you could uh, look at it in a totally opposite way as well this moment you were thinking of somebody as your beloved and think of your state and think of the meaning that that person has for you and then somebody tells you that this person is not that one and your beloved is out there somewhere there is a confusion and see how completely everything has changed immediately how immediately and how then can you miss seeing that everything is a flux it's a, a classic example of that a mother in a maternity ward yes the mother is having the child yes. and she is caressing uh, the baby and suddenly the nurse says oh by mistake the baby was exchanged uh, in, in yes. and the suddenly uh, the string of belongingness is cut yes hmm. so uh, my last question is Uh, related to the state of a liberated man so you uh, describe the state of liberated person uh, at two three places uh, in your discourse uh, i was reminded of raman maharshi uh, i was reading his book advait bodh dipika where he explains the state of a man who's who is egoless who is liberated he says his state is like that of a burnt rope there is a rope the burnt rope so its shape and size is still maintained but its ability to tie but its ability to be bondaged or bond that is gone so this is a very uh, nice way of uh, putting it burnt rope liberated man is a burnt rope externally just like the rope but without the typical attributes of the rope or externally just like anything externally just like anybody else internally nobody like a room that has been vacated hmm like a room you have checked out of the room is there ha huh? when you are uh, passing through an aisle between a series of rooms can you distinguish between rooms that are occupied and that are not can you no 106 107 108
So externally all the rooms look the same. The liberated person is a room without an occupant. So uh, you mean uh, the room, the walls of the room, uh, that is the body, yep. that, that will be there. Yes. That will be there. Yes. But internally there is nobody making mischief. Or doing anything else. Uh, before going, uh, or 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 a, a more a more befitting example could be a vacated prison cell, a hotel room. Uh, sounds a bit tempting. You know why should I check out? Especially if it's a good hotel. So liberated man is like a vacated prison cell. The cell remains. The prisoner is gone. The prisoner is free. Uh, before going, uh, last class, uh, you, you told many definitions about what is ego. You also said at the end of the class that today I told so many definitions of the ego. So uh, today I was sitting and compiling those definitions. I found 20 definitions. So I noted them down and uh, sent to Anmolji and few other people. Now, one thing I found very common. Last class, you laughed a lot. Uh, it means the moment you gave one line a definition and you exhaled, means you say one line and you laugh and you give another definition of ego and you laugh. So every it was because I was noting down uh, the definitions. I was hearing this every time a definition comes from you, you laugh. So then I was thinking whether the wisdom lies in the word or in your laughter. So it was nice. It was like you know asking whether the real thing is the rain or the thunder. Nothing. It's just a little more cloudy on a few days. Hmm? Just happens. Sometimes there are the clouds. Sometimes there is the clear sky. Sometimes it rains without the thunder. Sometimes there is thunder without rain. Sometimes there is rain and thunder. Koi din khaja, koi din lado. Thank you so much. Pranam Ashadi ji. So the question is like uh, from this quote, you said that uh, a stone and you are same uh, because uh, both are conscious. Uh, so, so I just want to understand like when we look towards saint, right? Uh, and we try to imbibe, uh, you know, uh, their verses and what they are. We try to tend ourselves towards them so that uh, uh, so that we achieve that uh, moksha or liberation. So, what is the difference between a stone and myself and uh, a saint, basically? If all are same consciousness, then uh, like what is I tend to? Then what do I want to become? Then? A stain is a, a saint. No, stone, myself and a saint, Sant. Hmm. So, a saint is a stone that does not think that it is not a stone. You are a stone that thinks that it is not a stone. That's the difference. The saint is lesser than you in the sense that the saint has no capacity to do something that you do. You think that you are not the stone. 
the saint has lost the capacity to think that he is not the stone. You have something extra. You have something additional. Hmm? Therefore, liberation is an unburdening of the additional, the unnecessary. The saint is very much all right in his stone like condition. And you will feel offended if called a stone. So, so is a stone liberated then? The stone, the stone never had anybody who was not liberated. It's like asking, has somebody checked out of that room? The answer is, nobody ever checked in. The one who checked in was an imagination. Therefore, there is no question of checking out. The stone is anyway always a stone. You have superimposed your individuality on the stone, but that has not fundamentally changed the stone. The stone was always liberated. The stone never had any need to be liberated. There was nothing in the stone that experienced bondage. Prakriti does not need to be liberated. The one who attaches himself to Prakriti needs to be liberated. Right? Stone needs no liberation. And is that holds true for animals as well? We will not go into that. Yeah? Man and stone are enough for our purpose. And Achari, what is the difference uh, or similarity between awareness and consciousness? Awareness and? Consciousness. Consciousness generally means the dualistic kind of uh, mixed corrupted consciousness in which you maintain the illusion of a distinct self. And so you say, I am conscious of the wall. I am conscious of the table. I am conscious of that man or woman. Hmm? So ordinary consciousness is always dualistic. I am there and the other is there. And that we call as consciousness, right? If you want to ordinarily test whether somebody is conscious, you will go to him and say, Can you listen to me? Can you see me? Hmm? So you check his dualistic perception. If somebody says, He does not know himself, you say the fellow is getting unconscious. So ordinary consciousness is very dualistic. Awareness is to know this duality and therefore not remain in it. You could call awareness as non-dual consciousness. In which your need to define yourself with respect to the seen object is gone. As long as you define yourself with respect to the other, to your dualistic counterpart, that's bondage. In awareness, there is nobody here feeling the need to give himself a definition using the other. The other might remain, but the other does not remain 
एज अ डिपेंडेंसी एज अ सपोर्ट टू लीन ऑन दैट्स अवेयरनेस अवेयरनेस इज कॉन्शियसनेस विदाउट अ सेंटर अवेयरनेस इज कॉन्शियसनेस विदाउट द ईगो द स्क्रीन हैज बीन लिबरेटेड ऑफ द सीन प्लीज कॉन्टिन्यू दैट इज ऑल आई हैव फॉर टूडे वंडरफुल थैंक यू हेलो आचार्य जी सो at times while learning from the gita i get a slightly nihilistic taste of the nature of the world um, and a prime example uh, being this verse like if everything in nature is a process or a phenomena we cannot label label phenomena as a greater phenomena or a lesser phenomena or a right phenomena or a wrong phenomena so uh, my question is then why should why why should krishna or arjun care if they win the war like arjuna's duty being to kill the embodied on the other side uh, and win the war uh, and to win the war is a natural process so would be if if it were the case that duryodhan wins it so all this gyan could have been given to arjuna despite the outcome of the war or or the war itself similarly in our uh, day to day life why should we care so much if a crime let's say is committed why not just lab- label it as a natural process and smile instead of taking serious actions against the criminal on which the institution of laws are based your entire question began with if everything in nature is a phenomena yes that's uh, i mean i have a that's not i mean yeah that sounds like please uh, wait 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 if everything in nature is a phenomena to whom to you right yeah now is everything in nature a phenomena change the if with is yes to you is everything in nature a phenomena to you is everything in nature a phenomena yes then you are krishna i mean so that's what we learned today is it sir we are we are not talking uh, ideals here to you forget about the if get into the is if is imagination right if is imagination and your entire question began with an if yes okay so replace the if with is to you is everything in nature a phenomena i mean if i say no would i be contradicting the truth how does that matter we are asking for the fact when you see things huh the way you lead your daily life do you look at people as processes no ha huh. so then the if has been answered right yes to you stuff in the world is not phenomenal to you stuff in the world is meaningful and purposeful what does phenomena mean phenomena basically means illusion and the purpose of all spirituality is to heal your suffering is the world a phenomena to you no therefore you suffer and therefore you must be shown that the world is a phenomena right right and therefore some action has to be taken krishna is bringing arjun towards that action through this gyan therefore this gyan is needed the purpose of spirituality is to not to deliver you abstract concepts it is to relieve you of your suffering always begin from your inner condition your inner condition is of illusion and consequent suffering it's not that krishna told you that the world is phenomenal so you start saying if the world is phenomenal vedant asks for whom to you it is not phenomenal therefore you have to learn that it is phenomenal and that's what the gita is about what arjun is doing is that he is embarking on a course of action that will keep proving to him that the phenomena is not a phenomena but a reality he says those are people not processes and if you believe in something 
too much and for too long then that belief becomes your truth krishna does not want arjun to continue in his beliefs because that would be a false truth he is saying oh i'll kill those people oh, they are not people at all they are processes but if you keep believing that they are people you will also keep believing that you are a person and if you are a person your suffering will continue so all 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 these are questions arising from bad logic and they have always been there well if the world is just an illusion why should we bother for the right action well if the rabbit is just a phenomena why should i not kill it eat it i have not killed anybody me lord there has been no murder because there was no person at all that is only process why are you sending me to the jail i didn't kill anybody because there was no person in the first place so all all these are instances of bad logic if you are saying there was no person first of all prove to me that you do not think of yourself as a person there might in the absolute sense have been no person but to you there was a person therefore in your own frame of reference you did commit a murder therefore you will be punished and therefore the objective of all punishment has to be to bring you out of your own frame of reference that's the objective of punishment to beat the nonsense out of you to beat your own personal frame of reference out of you and that's what is called bringing you back to your senses hmm? did the murder happen in your own frame of reference it did happen didn't it happen had you known that there is nothing called a murder you wouldn't have shot at that person in the first place because you already know you cannot kill him then why you fire at him in your own sense in your own inner world you did think that the person dies right and hence you fired at the person so in your own world you did commit a murder and therefore in your own world you must face a punishment it's all with respect to somebody that's vedan it always asks for whom to whom thank you acharya ji got it namaste sir um sir uh, you know we are process and uh, we are governed by certain principles and uh, you know of late i've been hearing lot of uh, uh, news about uh, ai and uh, you know one thing that uh, you know uh, strikes me is the fact that one ai process could be fed into another ai process and if uh, you know the the turing test determines the sentient capability of uh, of consciousness self awareness etc of a machine then one machine could be could inherently become lot more capable sort of super conscious than the previous one because that's that's something that human beings can't do we cannot transfer the complete brain to the another one so my question was uh, sir in this uh, uh, whole notion of consciousness self awareness and uh, volition and uh, and uh, you know moral ethics kind of conduct etc i i seem to see machine to be over powering human beings in the sense that uh human beings have created something but in a way it has created something more dangerous uh, which is kind of over powering the the sense of uh, our own uh, you know belonging as a human being uh, i definitely see this tinkering with the laws of nature the prakriti and everything is kind of really causing a lot of uh, challenges to the world i just wanted to hear your views on where ai is taking uh you know the world today with regard to uh the humanity and whether it's leading to the progress or uh, in the in the downward spiral i do not think i am very clear with the question in what sense do you think that ai is overpowering human consciousness uh what i think sir is uh, essentially what i am kind of looking for is uh to look uh, to have a better consciousness to to have to become a better self aware person and uh, when i look at some human uh, machine which is almost imbibing i mean replicating my own sense of consciousness self awareness etc 
somewhere i get the sense i also get perturbed that that machine itself is uh, you know uh, more powerful than me in terms of its co- super consciousness power no no what do you mean by super so, consciousness power that's where the haziness is what do you mean by super consciousness power super consciousness as is, as in one machine is has been created and the 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 capability of it has been fed into the another machine capability and with I mean, respect to what uh with respect to the initial uh, learning or the ai ai is actually uh, gotten uh, it can perform tasks right sir so how is that challenging human consciousness because uh, the simulation of the turing test itself says that uh, you know at certain point it is almost replicating uh the human being in terms of fooling the human beings in a sense that so it's, it's replicating yeah. that part of human consciousness that is any way very mechanical or replicable that which is replicable in you will be replicated for example a statue can be made that looks just like you because your body your physical features are all replicable so somebody will replicate them how does that threaten you you are not that within you which can be replicated and if there is something that can be replicated that is not you so let that be replicated what's the problem somebody makes a statue how does that threaten your existence somebody clicks a photograph how does that threaten your existence that looks like you but that's not you somebody downloads the entire content of your memory that's possible hmm each passing day that's becoming more and more possible the entire content of your memory can be downloaded hmm but that's not you right hmm or your genetic material can be taken and a clone can be raised but that's not you again how does that threaten you so go to nirvan shatkam hmm? when such doubts arise and worries you need to know what you are not and that which you are not let that be copied or substituted or outsourced or whatever somebody copies my voice how does that threaten me <laughs> am i my voice am i my voice so so nirvan shat kam hmm? and when when you can discount everything that you are not then there is चिदानंद रूप शिवो हम शिवो हम माइंड यू नो बडी कैन हॉल्ट द मार्च ऑफ साइंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी ऑल दैट साइंस कैन डू इट विल डू देर इज नो नीड टू फील थ्रेटेंड यू विल बी क्लोन्ड यू विल बी रेप्लीकेटेड ड्युप्लीकेटेड सब्सटिट्यूटेड देर फोर यू मस्ट कम टू दैट विद इन यू विच इज alone not transferable not available to be duplicated what is that that's who you are all else is just you know stuff that you are attached to and stuff is stuff just say i had another question uh, you did mention that there's a dance in prakriti everything is entertainment there's fun and but the ego is always in a quest of so- sorrow or i mean the whole existence of ego is because uh, there's a sorrow if the sorrow dissolves the ego dissolves etc then uh, sir my question was uh, when i look at a liberated person i mean 
maybe i mean correct me please please correct me if i'm wrong normally i see a sense of uh, uh, you know not not sort of a anand or a happiness in their face it's always that they, there is some sort of a uh, sorrow in their face as opposed to what prakriti is indicating that uh, you know you have to rejoice you have to be not in grief but when i look at uh, them i mean it's just like the, the the it's kind of contradicting to the message of what prakriti is uh, giving to them so why is it so sir am i my is my understanding correct on this sir? we look at how the ego operates it looks at everything from its own frame of reference hmm? you go to a person who is rejoicing and you say this person is suffering now what needs to change the fact or the definition of suffering you go to a person and as a fact he is actually rejo- rejoicing but from your own definition on you say he is suffering and because all your definitions are distorted they are coming from your own center right right when we rejoice that's a kind of very sick celebration that sick celebration we do not find in the liberated one when we do not find that sick celebration that maniac celebration in the liberated one we declare that that fellow is serious and suffering but the fact is that he is rejoicing and if you can push your ego aside then you will say oh so this from this now i develop my definition of celebration instead you say i already have a definition of celebration and if his condition matches my definition only then will i agree that he is rejoicing why should his condition match your definition you change your definition if you find the liberated man serious then change your definition to mean seriousness is celebration instead you want to stick to your definition and your definition postulates i said a very sick kind of celebration in which you are excited jumping thumping romping inebriated and that you call as partying not that kind of celebration you usually do not find in a liberated one so you say oh you know that fellow you know he is quite serious and something got wrong with him he looks very pensive probably mournful no that's where the celebration is you adjust your definition are you getting it if you find him weeping ha huh, then you change your definition because that's celebration that that's the part of it that concerns his state now there is another thing to it how do you know his state when he is not in front of you who are you with respect to him with respect to him you are a patient you are a student you are somebody to be taken care of you are somebody to be shown the way no so it is quite possible that internally he is celebrating but when he faces you he has to pretend anger who are you you are his patient he is the doctor that's the relationship why will the doctor show his so called real face to you the doctor will show one particular face that you need to see maybe you are of the type that you need to see his angry face maybe if he doesn't show you an angry face you will not study or improve or attend that does not mean that he is angry that means that you need to see an angry face please get the difference it's then not about his state it's about your requirement he does not bother for his state he is beyond botheration right but he bothers for your requirement and your requirement is that he must you must see his angry face that's what you require to see so he will show you an angry face but th- that's the thing about the ego 
it has very little capacity for self observation instead it wants to get into the mind of the liberated one it was guru nanak who said you may try as hard as you can but you will never get to know the mind of the liberated one that's from the adigrant you keep trying you keep speculating and the ego has a serious urge to know what is going on in the mind of the buddha but you will never know what's there in the mind of the buddha being who you are how will you know the mind of the buddha it's a part of essential humility to not to even try instead reflect on yourself if if you find him serious do not judge him look at yourself if you find him weeping do not judge him look at the world around him and if you find him scolding you then look at your own state he has no need to scold but you have a need to be scolded so it's rather a judgment on you not him understood sir thank you so much mm-hmm.